morning and welcome everybody. Good morning and welcome everybody. To everybody out there in this webinar, welcome. Welcome to the inaugural webinar for the WFSA's annual theme, Workforce Wellbeing. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for making time to come and talk about wellbeing for the workforce with us this evening, this morning, during your day. I'd like to thank the three speakers we have. I'd like to thank Sheree Johnson, I'd like to thank Babavi Ubadei and Divya Sharma for speaking with us today. I'd also like to thank Wayne, Christine, Francis and WFSA, Sophie and Rosa for the technical aspects of making this work, and Guillermo and Natalia, our Spanish translators this evening. I have some reminders. I'd like to remind you about the WCA, the World Congress of an Anesthesiologists Registration, which is still open in person, although the regular rate closes today on the 20th, but is still open for in-person or online registrations. I'd like to draw attention to the Fight Fatigue campaign, which has recently been endorsed by the WFSA, Fight Fatigue Together campaign. And finally, I remind you to send questions via the chat for the questions and answer session that we will have at the end of the speakers. So now I'd like to introduce to you Cherie Johnson, who's a registered psychologist, professional coach, author, speaker, and meditation teacher. She's been coaching doctors since 2015 and is the founder of Coaching for Doctors, Australia's first coaching practice dedicated solely to doctor development. In 2021, she published her international best-selling book, The Thriving Doctor, How to Be More Balanced and Fulfilled Working as a Doctor. And I'll let you tell the rest of your story, Sheree. So thank you for your time this evening. Thanks so much, Susan. I'd like to just acknowledge any First Nations people who are here in the audience today and um, recognise your uh, elders, past, present and future, and make particular uh, acknowledgement to the Gunai Kurnai people who have looked after this land where I am in the southeast of Australia for 60,000 years or more. Um, I've been asked to talk about why wellbeing now, and I think Susan's probably done enough introducing uh, of me. So I am a psychologist. I have written a book trying to capture what we do about uh, in coaching with doctors called The Thriving Doctor, and I will show you that during the slides. So I'll just uh, share my slides and see if we can get started. Oh, goodness. Despite twice testing, they seem to keep dropping out. So sorry, just give me a moment. There we go. Okay, so. Um, Perfect. All good. Thank you. Okay, so you can see my book there, The Thriving Doctor, if that's of interest to you. So uh, the question of why now, why should we be talking about wellbeing for doctors now is really as simple as um, this analogy of why should we, when, when's the best time to plant a tree? And I think we can all accept that planting a tree 50 or 100 years is probably the best time to have planted the tree. But if we haven't done that, failing that today is probably the best day to plant a tree. And I really feel like we've probably missed hundreds of thousands of opportunities to take care of our medics are better than we have. We have very significant um, burnout rates and significant sh workforce shortages all around the world now for our doctors and particularly our nurses. And so we really just cannot keep ignoring the well-being of our medics if we want to continue to develop and to deliver quality health care. When a doctor is well, every other health care goal is more likely to be achieved including patient safety, patient health outcomes, and patient healthcare experience. But also, and importantly, professional fulfillment is higher for doctors, clinical and technical performance is better, and career longevity tends to be extended. In simple terms, the doctors are happier and better at their job when they're well. And all of this, of course, means that organisations have more staff retention and staff attraction, less legal claims because of error and uh, adverse events, less conflict between colleagues, less work injury claims, and importantly, much more professional and community esteem. 
there's a very clear line between well healthcare workers and healthcare being able to be delivered, healthcare being able to deliver on its stated reasons for being. I want to be really clear tonight while I'm talking that we need to use a yes and frame or a both and frame for this conversation. Yes, we need to do a whole lot of systemic things to improve healthcare for the workforce. And we also need the work workforce to develop their skills in collaboration and community so that they can um, be better able to describe to us what they need, what the impact of their work is, and to really actively participate in envisaging the systemically um, improved what looks better medical system. Context is always important. So you do need to bring your own lens to what I'm saying tonight. We cannot continue to keep turning away from each other's and our own well-being. For example, if doctors continue to come to work 18 hours a day and push on through as medicine has taught so well, then this behaviour becomes normalised. Fatigue studies have shown, and I'm sure you're aware, that um, fatigue is the equivalent to consuming alcohol. It causes safety risks for patients, also for doctors and for their organisations. But the question becomes who will call this behaviour out? Who will disrupt these kinds of patterns? And anyone can really, but the position that we hold in the hierarchy has a very important impact. The power structure means that some people can call these, these problems out more easily than others. And where there's no strong leadership, we probably do need collective action. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, to the impact on individual well-being and also talk just to a couple of statistics and then I'll make a couple of systemic remarks. The research is really very clear. We didn't need a pandemic to highlight the importance of well-being in medicine, but the, but the pandemic has brought the spotlight to the, the, the reality that performance and capability of highly skilled health professionals like anaesthetists is enhanced or undermined by their state of well-being. If the purpose of healthcare is to help people have better health, to recover from disease and disorder, then the well-being of the caregiver, the doctor, must be taken into account. It is essential for delivering on the goal. Simulation centres, OSCEs, the apprenticeship model of medical training, all exist for one reason, to give the best chance of delivering optimal care to sick people so that they can regain or manage their health. The SIM, the OSCE, the training program are all means to an end, not the end in themselves. When we think of patients, doctor wellbeing is another means to an end. It's another way to optimise the patient's care and health outcomes. Doctor wellbeing has a direct and continuous impact on your ability to perform at your best, to provide the best care to the patients and the best leadership to your professional teams. Any doctor, even with excellent technical skills and extraordinary knowledge, can be undermined by their own humanness. Your well-being and your capacity are inextricably linked all of the time. Imagine that the doctor who's treating you has just found out this morning that they didn't get the job that they've been training for for six years that they've been coveting. Imagine if the doctor who's treating your child has just found out that their relationship is breaking up or, or even that their mum is in the emergency room having had a fall. These doctors are depleted, distracted or experiencing big emotions. Even if they're compartmentalising experts, they're using energy to keep their thoughts and their emotions suppressed and contained. That energy is no longer available for them to achieve peak performance in their technical role as an anaesthetist. Context is always important. Life keeps happening to doctors just as it does to every other person. When you are well, you can respond to dynamic changing circumstances more effectively than you can when you're under pressure and stressed. When you're under pressure, you're more likely to snap at a colleague or miss something important or miss the patient's values. Imagine if you have a full list of patients, and sadly some of you won't need to imagine this, it will have happened yesterday or today. You have a full list of patients uh, in the surgery and your colleagues have rung in sick or your roster's not full 
um, and you don't know any of the nurses that you're working with, you've never seen them before, and maybe you're the only anaesthetist in your space for the next eight hours. When you spend the time that you need to spend caring for the anxious patient and helping them get into surgery so that the list can start, even though you are extraordinarily well-trained, this structure, the system, the lack of workforce, your own depleting um, resources, challenge your capacity to, to deliver your technical skill in the kind of way you want to. If you're hungry, lonely, angry, late, tired, stressed or sick, these are all also challenging your capacity to deliver optimal care. And it's not because you're bad or wrong or not up to the job. It's simply because you're human and the systems are not supporting your humanness. Being human is so worth embracing. Being human means laughing, connecting, feeling joy and excitement and tenderness and love. When we ignore the well-being of the doctors, the nurses, the support staff, we, we are in part choosing to deliver suboptimal care. If we do not need these uh, faculties of empathy and compassion and emotion, then perhaps we don't need doctors to deliver all of the things that they do. But patients are human and an important ingredient for healing is feeling safe, seen and heard. Doctors who recognise their own humanity and attend to their own human needs to be well, safe, seen and heard themselves, create environments for patients to heal and for healthcare workers to thrive. I spoke with an anaesthetist two weeks ago in coaching who described a case uh, where a surgeon was out of their depth and needed to ask for help. The surgeon delayed calling for help <clears throat> and the surgery ended up being longer and riskier than it was expected to be. And the anaesthetist in coaching was sharing with me their frustration and disappointment about this circumstance. In this particular anaesthetist believes that part of their role is to maintain a calm kind of vibe and energy in the theatre so that the surgeon can deliver his best work and the patient can have their best outcome. This anaesthetist has invested a lot of time in developing their self-awareness and their communication skills. And so in this situation where they used to get angry and agitated and ramp up the situation for other people, They've now learned to regulate their own body and practice real-time um, mindfulness, and they're skilled at creating a calm contagion. And this is inspiring the rest of the team. It's also creating an environment where the surgeon has psychological safety and can start to ask for help more confidently. And the team have told me that this anaesthetist is not only changing their own capacity and skill, but also the culture in, this, in the theatre. And this development work has been achieved through individual coaching and sharing with their immediate colleagues about what's important in the way they want to work. And I want to contrast that with another situation, another group of anaesthetists who feel completely disempowered because they're working double um, on call, there are a lack of colleagues, and they're really wondering can they sustain their medical practice. Retention is dwindling and problems are multiplying. These doctors feel undervalued and underpaid because they're working so hard. Some of them describe feeling burnt out and some of them say they are experiencing moral injury. They feel torn between their desire to serve their community and their team and their patients and their desire to have a life outside of medicine. These doctors feel very worried that something awful is going to happen to a patient. Some of them have insomnia, all of them miss their families um, and even the basic things of eating and, and having a drink during the day are difficult because of the lack of colleagues and systems. These anaesthetists feel no agency and no power in their system. This team is at much higher risk of poor clinical decision-making, making an error, getting into conflict uh, with the patient's family or with their colleagues. But they're also at risk of getting sick, of leaving their job, of developing a mental health condition, and even suicide ideation. Well-being, performance at work, optimal care of patients and longevity of your career are all inexplicably linked. In case you think I'm being a little bit dramatic, I just want to share a couple of statistics with you. Most uh, countries, unfortunately, don't have annual public statistics that we can access or there's a long gap between when they do the survey and when they report the data. So I am using US um, statistics tonight. They may or may not be um, representative of what happens in your country. 
In the US, Medscape uh, do a survey every year. And in 2019, 84% of physicians reported being happy or very happy in their job. In 2023, 58% of physicians reported being happy or very happy. I think this is a, quite a distressing figure. And I think it uh, just really makes it very real how much we need to be talking about well-being. In the same uh, Medscape survey, 31% uh, of residents, I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for this, but 31% of residents said that they rarely or never have time for a social life. The same, about the same number, 32%, they said they rarely pay attention to their own well-being. And 37% said that they... Uh, that they, their integration, their work-life integration was worse than what they imagined it was going to be. And the picture really gets worse. In the same survey, 16% of residents said they had suicidal thoughts in the previous year, and a whopping 52% said that they had been depressed either some of the time or all of the time. The state Shall of well -being... We... You have two minutes left. Thank you, Rosa. State of Wellbeing report that uses the Wellbeing Index and uh, the American uh, Medical Association estimate that 54% from their surveys of physicians are experiencing burnout. And uh, the Wellbeing Index says that 70% of medical students are reporting emotional problems. I do just want to pause and move away from these pretty grim stats just to note that in the Wellbeing Survey, in um, the Mayo Clinic Wellbeing Survey, 83.5% physicians reported that their work is meaningful. I think this is really significant because uh, purpose and meaning are great indicators of well-being. And so doctors still, even though a large portion of them are burnt out, 83% are saying that they get a lot of meaning in their work. So we really want to look at how can we build systems that tap into this inherent meaning that physicians experience um, and 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 shift away from this common burnout experience. Um, it's as it seems to me that our systems and our medical cultures of perfectionism, competition, stoicism are really eroding the opportunities that doctors uh, want to have to live congruently with this sense of meaning and value. I'll just say a couple of things about um, organizational well-being programs. Uh, we know that organisation wellbeing programs that are sort of rolled out over whole hospitals or healthcare systems don't work. Uh, the first problem is that they're not specific enough. And you've heard me say a number of times that context is always important. We really need to be developing our wellbeing programs at the unit level where we're talking to the actual people about what would work for them and what's their wellbeing description. And the second thing is to say that um, it seems that according to the wellbeing, the um, again, the Mayo Clinic research, that only 10% of, of employees will use any wellbeing program on average. So what that means is we really probably need at least 10 wellbeing programs and probably more so that each doctor can decide for themselves what's going to work for them. And the reason that's really important is because autonomy is incredibly important to wellbeing. And so, uh, for instance, it might be more useful for a health system to work out how a doctor can book a half day off or a couple of hours off to go and see their GP than it would be to put another on-demand program on the intranet that maybe nobody ever looks at. So just in finishing, I'd like to just say that medicine is a relational business. The best medicine is delivered when there's a trusting relationship between the patient and the caregiver. And many anaesthetists have told me that they don't need to worry because their patients are asleep. But once we get past that old joke, uh, they say things like how rewarding it is to help an anxious patient be able to settle and go into their surgery or how great it feels to help a patient um, be relieved of their pain. Well-being is a catch-all phrase that describes what humans want to experience in their life today and in the future. And well-being is really about setting ourselves up and our collective up for the future. It's a way of saying, I feel capable. I feel like I can respond to the life that, to, to what life's throwing at me. I feel able to con connect and create and make decisions for my loved ones and my family, to be able to achieve and rest when I need to, to be respected, to contribute and participate, to feel seen and heard. I've worked with hundreds of doctors and I know that you all know many doctors too, um, and I haven't met one yet who doesn't want well-being. Well-being is perhaps the untapped means for achieving our shared goals of great patient health outcomes, healthy communities 
and long-term fulfilling careers after all that training. Every goal the healthcare system professes to hold is more likely to be delivered when those providing the care are well. A big part of helping healthcare workers be well is to value them. It's really crucial to achieving all of the goals in healthcare that we uh, recognise we're not trading the patient's health for somebody else's health. I really want to uh, encourage you all to be very active in this really essential conversation about doctor, doctor wellbeing for your own benefit, for the benefit of your colleagues, for your patients, for their families and your families and for our communities. Uh, I'm going to let my really esteemed colleagues uh, paint the picture in more detail for you now in terms of models and things that are working on the ground. Please may you be well and may you be well supported and thank you for listening. Thank you, Cherie, and may you be well also. That was a great start to our webinar, so thank you. I'd like now to introduce Dr. Babavi Ipade, who is the um, clinical lead in simulation and an anesthesiologist at the Dinanath Mangeshka Hospital and Research Centre in Pune, India. Um, she's the regional director for the VAST Steering Committee. She's a WFSA certified VAST simulation facilitator and instructor, Mayo Clinic certified simulation uh, facilitator and Lifebox certified safe operating room simulation instructor. So this evening, she's going to speak with us about um, the role of VAST simulation in wellbeing. Thanks, Babavi. Thank you, Dr. Susan, and uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, Shari Johnson, I think uh, the concepts are really so profound that, uh, yes, they need to really come on the clinical floor. We are going to look at how can it be practically implemented using vital anesthesia simulation training. So I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, we are going to begin our talk regarding uh, well-being and vital anesthesia simulation training. A warm hello to everyone here. Uh, I'm Dr. Vaipavi Upadhe, a vast instructor, and I bring greetings to all of you from India. I will be speaking on well-being and vital anesthesia simulation training course. In today's session, I plan to introduce you all to vital anesthesia simulation training and how vast pedagogy helps healthcare professionals achieve well-being and build well-being leaders. VAST uses immersive simulation to train healthcare professionals, especially in low resource and remote areas with routinely available equipment. Common clinical emergencies are simulated followed by a reflective debriefing. A strong focus is on developing non-technical skills of healthcare professionals. A multidisciplinary participation is the hallmark of VAST. For more information, please refer the website mentioned here. Vital Anesthesia Simulation Training came to India with the support from WFSA. The first training was conducted in Hyderabad, 2019, under the leadership of Dr. Geeta Nath. Total of three VAST facilitator courses, six VAST courses and one VAST well-being course have been conducted till date in India. VAST provides an opportunity to all healthcare professionals for transformative learning. So what is transformative learning? This is a cycle of transformative learning. As per Mesiro, the transformative learning opportunity for an individual begins with a new experience or a new approach. After the experience, a critical self-reflection is necessary to begin the process. It is followed by discussion with peers to know all the other perspectives as well. A profound self-awareness with a probable change in perspective may happen with time. This is experienced by all participants and facilitators of vast courses. However, there could be barriers for this cyclical process and hence to the transformation and learning. For example, there could not be a new experience, probably in the monotony of the work. Or if there is an experience, then the critical reflection is lacked due to lack of time and lack of debriefing. If a critical reflection is done, probably it is not discussed with peers for the self-awareness and for the change to happen, which follows through. The barriers to this cyclical transformative learning process could also be external, such as the power differences, 
varying communication styles and differing knowledge bases within the teams. So to reduce these barriers during the learning cycle, the vast course participants are pre-briefed about the principles of learning environment. The first one is basic assumption that is held by all, and it says that we all are intelligent and capable. We care about doing our best and we want to improve. This encourages participants and facilitators to cast aside the judgmental nature. The pre-briefing continues to remind participants to maintain confidentiality and have mutual respect for each other, which is essential to make the sessions a safe learning space. We as facilitators declare that the mistakes are allowed while learning. These mistakes stay in the room when the participants leave this room after the session. Participants take only the learning with them. We, all, we as facilitators also ensure depersonalization. We focus on what happened and the why behind it rather than the person involved. The simulated experience is then given to the participants after the pre-brief. During the debriefing of that simulated experience, generally, the facilitators explore and develop an understanding of participants' perspectives and create an opportunity to learn from each other. And hence, a psychologically safe learning environment is created. This exploration of perspectives during debriefing is done with good judgment using advocacy and inquiry. This technique allows facilitators to share their opinions on what they observe during the scenarios while simultaneously exploring participants' perspectives. Emotions of participants are validated as well. An opportunity to vent and get emotional relief is provided. Healthcare professionals can be quite critical of self and each other if a desired outcome is not achieved. The positives are highlighted, which helps the team to focus on the process and not only on the outcomes. The morale of the team is kept by on by doing this. Vast courses achieve transformative learning through these methods. So is transformative learning and well-being of a healthcare professional linked? Glenn Sherman's article in Journal of Transformative Education says that they are mutually supportive. Mindfulness practices enhance critical thinking. If offered together, would lead to an integrated approach to achieve transformative learning and well-being. Vast well-being course was conducted in May 2022 at Halifax, Canada. It's a wonderful platform to talk about burnout and well-being. I personally learned many scientific coping strategies to recognize, to prevent, and to overcome burnout. The strategies that participants brainstormed on were at an individual level, at a team level, at a department level, at an organization level, as well as as an anesthesia fraternity. This was truly inspiring for me and hence I decided to bring the well-being course to India. This personal transformation uh, actually, apart from being an assertive anesthesiologist, I was much kinder, accepting and compassionate to self and others. The one-day course that was conducted in Pune in India in 2023 was well supported by WFSA and VAST. I'm happy to share that it was attended by diverse healthcare professionals, anesthesiologists, surgeons, nurses, anesthesia technicians, operating room managers, psychologists, quality and patient safety leads as well. Scientific collaborative strategies help prioritize well-being. We as vast facilitators use the transformative learning pedagogy and created psychological safety to discuss burnout by robust pre-briefing. This helps participants to share their experiences. Facilitators help them reflect, supported them as they dealt with difficult emotions. They also guided their critical thinking and finally motivated them to take steps to move towards possible solution. There is a disclaimer though, this is not a therapy for people experiencing significant mental health concern. They need to seek help from mental health experts. Dr. Jonathan Bailey and the other founder members of VAST evaluated the impact of this one-day well-being course. These are the few feedbacks that I have shared on the screen here. The study concluded that causes of burnout are complex and multidimensional. Vast well-being did not change measures of burnout and fulfillment within two months after the course, but did have a meaningful impact by raising awareness, reducing stigma, fostering connection, providing skills to prioritize well-being, 
and empowering people to seek workplace change. This encouraged me to take feedbacks after a year from the participants of Wellbeing course conducted in India in 2023. The feedback had four aspects, a personal change in themselves, a change in the outlook towards their teams, changes at the department level, and a deeper understanding of organization level strategies to promote well-being. The personal changes are enumerated here for all of you to see. Some participants say that it is okay to care for self. I will make sure I will sleep well, I will eat well on time. They said their listening skills have improved. They, re they respond rather than react to situations. Anger management has improved as well. Their ideas are able to be communicated well. They share perspectives, they share mental models. Some of the participants had a strong spiritual background. They told us that we knew about the breathing techniques already, but then we learned how to connect these techniques to workplace. Now they practice mindfulness more often. The innate judgmental nature seems to have reduced. They started expressing gratitude more often. Healthy habits, they did confess that it is work in progress, but they are working on it. The task matrix of plan, do, delegate and differ was used by all of them. They began to ask for help when they need and prioritize well-being instead of earning more money. One of the feedback that has profoundly you know, um, touched me and I have presented it here as it is, is one of the feedback came was it helped them achieve Obaitori. Obaitori is a Japanese concept that the people are like flowers. They bloom in their own time and their own individual ways. One of the feedback at the end says, I might still fail in achieving my targets or responsibilities, but I accept it with grace and satisfaction. The storm in me has settled down and I feel happy and content. A change in outlook towards healthcare team as well has happened. Interaction with colleagues have improved. Considering team opinions is a practice now. They choose the battles well. They choose the battles where patient safety is affected and not interpersonal conflicts. Understand the mindset and perspective of diverse healthcare professionals in our teams. They also predict behaviors in certain situations which could be triggers for conflicts uh, during our work time. They appreciate good work too. The certain changes at departmental level, the departmental WhatsApp group of colleagues for humorous chats. So it's a laugh out, burn out WhatsApp group. Academic department supports the trainees and looks after their well-being. Rostering of duties are also given due consideration. This meta-analysis found that the physicians could gain important benefits from interventions to reduce burnout, especially from organizational strategies by weaving burnout rooted in issues relating to working environment and organizational culture. So the mission of our organization in Pune is a holistic approach towards life for patients as well as for healthcare professionals. Behavioral and Lifestyle Disorder Clinic, a unique kind of a clinic which runs yoga, meditation, nutrition, and parenting sessions by experts for healthcare professionals. Appreciation and felicitation of personal and team achievements, such as in sports, in hobbies, as well as celebration of Women's Day. Induction and orientation program includes well-being programs for all our new doctors. These new doctors are made aware of what the organization offers for our well-being. And this helps us connect them to the vision of the hospital as well. Multidisciplinary and interdepartmental team trainings via simulation has been well accepted. The cohesive between, cohesiveness between teams is our recent focus. And I must say, well-being could be the cohesive gel. To summarize, vital anesthesia simulation training or vast courses offer transformative learning to anesthesiologists and other healthcare professionals. Vast Wellbeing is a transformative mindfulness-based course which stimulates multidisciplinary healthcare professionals to develop their own strategies to promote personal and professional well-being and for preventing burnout in the workplace.
I must thank WFSA for giving me this wonderful platform to speak about well-being and vital anesthesia simulation training. The upcoming vast well-being course is in India in Pune. If anyone is interested, please do just ping me. That's my email address. Thank you. And over to you, Susan. Thank you very much Bai, for that wonderful talk and summary of the VAST program. I'd now, now, now like to introduce Dr. Divya Sharma. Dr. Sharma is an anaesthetist at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Perth um, in the Department of Anesthesia. She's been the Director of Clinical Training in the Medical Education Unit for Consultant Development. Her clinical interests include ENT, plastics and regional anaesthesia, and she's been an anaesthesia wellbeing advocate in her department since 2007. She's also developed a bespoke consultant leadership program for all senior staff and leadership roles within her hospital. So thank you, Divya. We're looking forward to, to your talk also. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to both uh, speakers, Cherie and Beba Vivadia for uh, their uh, fantastic talks. Uh, so Kaya, hello and namaste from Perth, Western Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge the Wajak people of Noongar Buja, which is the southwestern corner of Australia, as the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm talking from, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and hope to work uh, hope to work um, towards reconciliation by learning about First Nations healing practices. So both our speakers have spoken about what well-being is and also a bespoke course to improve uh, well-being at four different levels. Now, I won't very much touch on why this is necessary. Cherie Johnson covered that quite comprehensively. Um, and But I want to talk about what does structure look like? It, it can be all very rosy, but what does a well-being structure um, look like if you want to implement that in your workplace? And then how can I implement this in my work, uh, in your workplace? Um, as you may know, our uh, Australian Medical Association found that in 2013, doctors have higher rates of psychological distress than the Australian general population and anaesthetists have the highest rate of completion suicide. Of course, COVID brought into focus healthcare workforce its challenges. But we need to be able to uh, look at um, how we can uh, improve systems in the hospitals that we work in. And I'd like to share what we've implemented as I've been head of um, wellbeing in our department for over 15 years. Now, the disclaimer is that uh, the canary in the coal mine, it's a saying that uh, it's an expression that dates back to 1911. I'm not going to be talking about yoga, but it's the concept of having a canary as an early detection system for hazardous gases in coal mines. And it was introduced by John Scott Haldane, who I'm sure you all remember from the gas wars in Great Britain. So miners used caged canaries to determine if there were any hazardous gases, methane or carbon monoxide. And if the canary died, that would signify gas levels are poisonous to the miners as well, and they should exit the mine immediately. Now, these birds were chosen because they get air in their system um, during inhalation and exhalation, doubling the dose of potential toxic gases. Luckily for our birds, in 1986, an electronic warning detection system was put in place, saving the birds from potential harm. So this is what I'd like to speak about. What is our electronic warning detection or systems changes that we can put in, our, we can put in place in our workplace? And so I'd like you to understand three fundamental concepts of well-being at work um, that are evidence-based. First of all is the wellness hierarchy. Second of all is psychological safety. And third is actually occupational health and safety. So the wellness hierarchy was actually first published in the American Journal of Medicine in 2019. Not that not that um, far away, really, and references Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Harking back to what Cherie said, is it, it's a systematic approach to what makes a doctor a well-being. So at the basic level is enough food, sleep, personal comfort, and stable baseline mental health. 
Then we have next the safety of a doctor and their patients with a secure job or physical safety to practice. And I'd like to acknowledge our colleagues in uh, war zones where this safety may well be a luxury. Then we have respect, where a doctor is respected by the bureaucracy and able to practice their craft with the acceptance of their creed and religion. We move up to appreciation, where an individual feels valued by their peers, their patients. And then finally, that ability to contribute to medicine and heal patients. So it's that meaning that um, medics bring into their workplace that uh, sits at the top of that wellness hierarchy. Now, the second most profound concept, and this is a concept both speakers have touched on before me, is psychological safety. And it is the belief that you will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with your ideas, your questions, your concerns and the mistakes. So it's a shared belief held by the team. To quote Dr Helen Bevan from Britain um, NHS and Professor Amy Edmondson from America, psychological safety is a team sport. When you have psychological safety in your workplace, you feel safe when you make suggestions. Your, your team sees mistakes as ways to improve the system and recognising that individuals come to work to do their best. And then the third crucial point is that most Western countries, at least, have occupational health and safety laws which govern the behaviour of the employer. And health and safety is not only physical, but psychological as well. And this can be seen in this Hong Kong Occupational Health and Safety Ordinance. And so it's not only the employer's role, but in fact, the 2023 update states that whilst employers ensure the safety and health of employees, employees at work are there to take care of others and cooperate with the employer. And in addition to these legal obligations, there are actually many other benefits of a health service having a mentally healthy workplace. Patient experiences are better when staff feel that they have a good working environment and staff have low emotional exhaustion. Employers who actually create and sustain a great place to work, which I'm sure now their Barbie's uh, um, workplace is, you attract and keep the best workers. And when staff are engaged, they're actually more willing to extend that extra hand, stay back, help a colleague. So you get that result in improvement in performance, productivity and quality. So let's go down those three concepts. Let's go to um, structure in a workplace. In 2014, Anthony LaMontagne developed a model to integrate that approach to mental health. And the idea was to think of three key processes. One was to prevent that harm. Two was to promote the positive, And three was to manage the illness. And this was really the beginning of recognising that structural approach guideline to well-being at work. Because it, before it seemed to be too much of a indigestible problem, so to speak. In our hospital, we've teased this out a little bit when you can think of individual, organisational or environmental aspects to this. So individual focuses on those individual needs. So for example, people that come to work, you want to provide them access to health services and information such as orientation. You want to build the knowledge and skills of your employees, adopt a healthy lifestyle, seek support. Organisationally, you need an active and visible commitment from leadership, and I think we're coming back to this. Leadership is required to have business practices that support the wellbeing and culture, and that might be as simple as moving a roster from days to evenings to nights and not having random nights within your roster, for example. And environmental is providing a work environment that supports well-being and encourages healthy behaviours. And that's about ergonomics and human factors, but also that violence and aggression resources. And uh, even but going back to the organisational level, to have things in place um, to help with bullying and discrimination and harassment. So 2014, now... In 2019, Long Lives Healthy Workplaces, and I, this slide is from the website, was an initiative of our wellbeing special interest group and uh, in partnership with Every Mind. And we had uh, the Prevention Hub give us um, extra funding. But the purpose was to provide a toolkit to support better mental health and wellbeing for the anaesthetists and anaesthetic trainees. 
And it had five strategies. One was to improve the culture of medicine to increase well-being and reduce the stigma around mental ill health. Two was to improve the training and work environments to reduce your risk. Three was to improve the capacity to recognise and respond to those needing supports. Four was to better support anaesthetists and trainees who had actually been impacted by mental ill health and or suicide. And finally, five was to improve leadership, coordination, data. Now, this is all very good, but at 90 pages, it's rather a large document to digest. And whilst it remains the most comprehensive collation of evidence behind different wellbeing strategies, it's best used as a reference for those wishing to delve into the evidence further. Luckily for all of us, the, in October 2020, the Australian Medical Association, in um, conjunction with uh, and, and referencing from medical students right up to senior doctors, developed this Every Doctor, Every Setting, a national framework um, that built and condensed the work of Every Mind and Anesthesia, uh, and, and that Every Mind did. So it was developed under the guidance of a national working group and those premise of those five strategies that are effectively primary, secondary and tertiary prevention, mental health promotion and, of course, the most important, leadership. Now, mental health promotion is number four on this, but I'd like to touch on it first because it's about improving the culture of the medical profession to enable well-being and this is where things like having a comprehensive orientation so that there's a statement of expectation for something as simple as the new doctor understanding how they can call in sick or how they access their overtime payment we want to promote work-life balance so that we want to ensure that everybody has access to their own general practitioner or primary care physician we want them to encourage uh, people to have a healthy lifestyle and make use of their leave um, and be encouraged to take leave. And then we want to encourage discussion. So invite people with personal experience of recovery and management of self-harm and suicide to share their stories and ensure that there are appropriate supports available for the person sharing the story and the audience as well. So that's something in the mental health promotion. When we talk about primary prevention, it's really about reducing individual risk factors, but also the environmental risk factors. And, and, and this is where you need um, systems in place to prevent job strain, fatigue and burnout. So these rostering practices have to identify unsafe work hours and you want to um, implement evidence-based safe working hours. And then, of course, reviewing and implementing policies that stamp out or um, uh, that stamp out bullying, harassment and discrimination, setting a zero tolerance, tolerance approach. And as you can see, this is where leadership is required and uh, it starts at the top. It doesn't mean that you can't start from the bottom either as a, as a member of the department, but really it is about having uh, heads of departments um, and heads of hospitals understanding, going back to that, what Cherie said, you in fact have better primary care of your patients and less critical outcomes when these kind of things that are, you know, are very, very practical are managed. Now, secondary prevention is about identifying and responding to issues early and providing support. So research suggests that doctors don't actually diagnose depression in themselves or their colleagues, and they actually miss warning signs of suicide ideation. And when mental health is actually, ill health is recognised, doctors and medical students are reluctant to seek help because there's a strong social and self-stigma because the doctor or the medical student fears that they might appear unhealthy or weak, that their licence might be restricted, and that they're exposing themselves to litigation. So this is where doctors need to um, have uh, and systems need to have uh, evidence-based training in suicide prevention for all doctors and medical students. Um, implement specific trainings in settings with the supervisors and managers. So something like this vast course, for example, can help uh, people not only recognise when they're feeling well, but recognise ill health as well. And we need interventions within an organisation that can identify and respond to those who need uh, individual support. And of course, 
we need to train a subset of doctors who are really good at helping doctors and looking after doctors um, to come back to work. And that brings me to tertiary prevention. Dr. Shama, you have two minutes left. No problem. The medical profession um, uh, with lived experience of mental ill health and suicide can play an important role in reducing that stigma. So we need tailored stay at work and return to work practices. And especially in our age of global medical workforce shortages, we need to support medics to stay back in the workplace because governments world over are eager to um, replace a medic with a less qualified and cheaper workforce. And finally, without leadership and a willingness to understand motivators, no well-being is possible. And the leader sets the culture from the top. And the best example of this, when the chief of service drives a well-being initiative in their region, as dom demonstrated by Dr. Albert Chan in Hong Kong. So where do we get started? There's a myriad of resources, best practices, and well-being special interest group was started in 1994, and it's a tripartite group with the Australian New Zealand College of Anaesthetists, the Australian Society of Anaesthetists, and the New Zealand Society of Anaesthetists. And it has a whole load of evidence-based documents on what is the evidence-based management of various situations, for example, a well-being advocate. In Australia and New Zealand, for an anaesthesia department to receive accreditation for training, there must be consultant anaesthetists performing the role of a wellbeing advocate. In our 600-bed hospital with a department of 100 anaesthetists that are work 70 FTE, we have seven wellbeing advocates that are trained in mental health first aid, peer support and psychological first aid, and we're now supported by two hospital staff psychologists. We also have one senior trainee as a wellbeing lead for the year. We like to choose somebody local and they're in charge of our buddy program and monthly registrar lunches because they feed back anonymously from the registrars if there's concerns to the wellbeing team and our head of department. And they're also receiving training um, just like any other wellbeing advocate and go on to become wellbeing advocates in their consultant lives. And so this is a mind map of the activities within our wellbeing um, team against four pillars discussed earlier, all of which our leadership team gives active support of, of all these activities, because our wellbeing team looks after consultants, registrars, and our anaesthesia assistants and technicians. Um, and so in summary, what we have is the basis of structural wellbeing program is that understanding of the wellness hierarchy, psychological safety and occupational health and safety laws. There's a body of evidence out there about how you go designing something in your workplace and getting started requires engaged leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much, Davia, for giving us a lot to think about in terms of next steps. And I think a really good question, if you're watching this, is to think about whether or not you have a wellbeing advocate or someone leading this work in your department um, and whether you might be that person or whether there's someone obvious locally. Um, I think that the resources that Divya talked about were developed within the wellbeing SIG by people who kind of started doing wellbeing and read around it and those resources were written by the individuals in response to real life events and things that happened need within the department um, and the move towards having well-being advocates in all training departments within Australasia really came from that work. So now I'd just like to spend the last few minutes with some questions that we've received um, and I'll direct the questions to an individual if that's okay. Um, so the first thing, uh, first question I'd like to direct to Vi, um, and it's a question about the role of faith and authentic spiritual life as a contributor to well-being. Um, and I'm I'm reminded of the the candle lighting ceremony that we had um, as part of the well-being course in Pune, and I just wondered if you could sort of articulate some thoughts about how. Um, I guess you mentioned mindfulness incorporated within pre-existing practice for practitioners. So um, actually in India, the, the spiritual practices are quite profound. The breathing techniques have been regularly done 
as spiritual practices like yoga, meditation, and uh, at the same time, uh, every initiative that we take, we begin the initiative by lighting a lamp, which signifies that may the light spread, may the knowledge increase, may the spirit inside us, you know, the light inside us really grow and shine so that the others get illuminated as well. So the concept of spiritual well-being uh, has been profoundly there in the culture and uh, the vast well-being course pretty much gave it a platform to talk about it and apply these techniques to the workplace. So I think it has been like a connecting uh, platform between the spiritual practices previously existing to the healthcare system. Thank you very much, Vi. And my, my personal experience of it was that I think it, it was a way of giving hope to the possibility of well-being and investing in well-being as a as a a, a way of, of improving and, and dealing with some of the reality of, of work. Thank you very much. Um so my next question I'd like to um direct to Sheree. Um Sheree, I'm curious to hear. Uh, with the coaching that you're doing, how, how do your doctors um, configure their lives to be available for coaching? Um, I'm often sort of challenged when I make suggestions about wellbeing initiatives that there's no time or there are already existing um, ways of doing this with exercise or they might do mindfulness and, and the addition of a coach is felt to be, you know, a time um, a time based activity. Where, how do they configure the value of, of this? Um, do you have any insights on how it, how it comes about for individuals? I think you kind of answered the question, Susan, already in that it's really about what's your priority at the moment. So there are times in our lives where we prioritise exercise because we think that's going to make us sleep better or feel better or, you know, be stronger or whatever, and it's the same thing. There are moments in people's lives where they decide they want therapy or they want to come to a coach or they need to change their diet because something else has changed in their life so you're right if it doesn't have a priority it's very difficult to make it happen um, it's like you know reading about doing 10 push-ups and the value of 10 push-ups is not the same as doing 10 push-ups and going to the gym and having a, a, a trainer actually help you um, with your goals is a, a very effective way for lots of people and so it's the same in that regard um, in terms of the way we deliver our coaching, we try. We have a very clear view that we are here to support doctors, not to make more stress for them. So we work at night time, we work in the morning, we work on the weekend. We try and uh, fit into the doctor's schedule. That's the, that's the bit that we're in control of, I guess. Thank you very much. And a question for Divya. Um, this question, I think, is something we've certainly covered. Are leaders in your organisation? engaged in the need for well-being um, in your uh, centre? In my centre, yes, uh, because I think uh, through Australia New Zealand, um, certainly COVID uh, really supercharged our occupational health uh, and safety systems so that now we actually have psychologists that are there just for staff, not psychologists that are there for just the patients as well. Um, so that's really... Uh, changed um, our our perspective and role. I noticed one of the questions asked, what about those countries with low resources? And I think uh, just calling on what uh, their Barbie and Cherie have said is, uh, when you look at your circle of control, the thing that you can control is the psychological safety of yourself and your teams. So sitting down and having a chat with your immediate team, because as an anaesthetist, you are the leader in your um, theatre, you are the leader in your department. You, everyone is a leader. Doctors are leaders, um, and so even having a team huddle at the at the beginning of the day uh, and saying, "This is what the work that needs to get done. How was your day?" These kind of things can occur, um, and allowing an understanding. I think going back to where bringing in that vast idea, the understanding that those five minutes that you spend going around the room, introducing yourselves to one another 
a, a, a precious time that actually saves time. And by the end of the day, you actually it, it doesn't take away from efficiency at all um, because it, it becomes that shared mental model of what needs to be done during the day. And I would encourage the team huddle, certainly in our institution, um, is to encourage having nursing staff and um, surgical staff. And we, we have our medical students uh, come to that huddle, so fair with us that day to be able to um, model it. That's how that, that that that's how I would say you can start. Yeah, so that's that's referencing the the World Health Organization briefing, debriefing, and checklist um, phenomenon. Yes. We've certainly used that as a wellbeing initiative as well. So I I'd, I'd like to finish really by um, acknowledging the the Spanish audience um, and the questions that we've received from you. Um, thank you for your um, interest in the vast course, which I'm sure. Bavi will be able to um, follow up on for you. Um, and also, I, I do hope perhaps the question around suicidal ideation and loss of our colleagues, which is always um, deeply felt and a, a real driver for all of us in this work to avoid that circumstance or to learn um, what we can do to prevent that in the future. Um, I, I do hope some of the, the conversation has been helpful for that. For you also. Um, so, so thank you to our audience, to everybody who has joined us this evening. Um, keep doing the work of wellbeing. If you're at the World Congress in Singapore, you will see wellbeing advocates. They will be clearly visible um, by a number of devices yet to be disclosed, um, but you will know who we are. So please come up and chat. Um, we'll be hanging around the Global Village um, loosely associated with the Australian Society have a bit of property in the global village. Um, and again, I remind you to look at the resource for Fighting Fatigue um, Together campaign. So thank you, everybody. And I'll draw the webinar to a close. Thank you. Thank you.